At the very basic level, you have to try to understand what is Bitcoin. And I can answer that question in five words. What is Bitcoin? It's digital money. But that doesn't really capture it. It's, it's more like the internet of money. But, but really, it's a consensus decentralized network based on blockchain technology and a proof-of-work algorithm that allows a digital token to act as a reward system for a game theoretical competition between decentralized miners who validate, oh my god, and it immediately goes off the cliff, right? <laughs> the answer to the question, what is Bitcoin, I've answered it. It's a 300-page book. Um, and when you read that book, you'll start down the path, or if you read that book, you'll start down the path of answering the question, what is Bitcoin, and then you'll find after a couple of years, that you are still trying to understand what is Bitcoin. And part of the reason for that is because Bitcoin is a really new technology. It is a really disruptive technology, but it also is a, an abstraction on a technology that is really old. And that technology is money. So money is a tool, it is a technology. It actually shares commonalities with linguistic structures, because we use it almost like a language to communicate value among, among ourselves, right, in a society. So, who wants to tell me here how old money is? Any idea? Anyone? Five thousand years. Okay, that's a good good guess. Um, bit older. Try again. So the problem with trying to understand the history of money <coughs> is that money is older than history. Oops. <laughs> and we could go and look at the writing about money. Money is older than writing. <coughs> now that may confuse you a bit. You're like, money is older than writing? That can't be. But in fact, if you look at the first forms of writing that we find, they're spreadsheets. There are counting ledgers. The first thing scratched onto tablets, uh, created with twigs and things like that, are accounting ledgers. They represent how many amphorae of oil were given to the pharaoh. And if you go even further back, we find ancient forms of money among the ruins of ancient civilizations. Beads, feathers, shells, giant stones. Money has taken many forms, but it exists and has existed almost as long as language. This is a truly ancient technology. So it's not 5,000 years. It's probably close to 500,000 years old. In fact, we see money emerge within other species. Highly intelligent species like primates, certain types of birds like crows, even marine mammals like dolphins, have forms of tokens that they use to express value to each other, or they can very quickly learn the mechanics of money. You can teach primates that if you turn in this pebble, you get a banana, and then watch within a very short period of time, how that not only becomes part of the primate culture, but gets passed down to the next generation, and they start inventing economic activities. Not nice economic activities. They invent strong-armed robbery, beat up the other monkey, take its pebbles, and you can get bananas. They invent sexual favors for pebbles, so you can get bananas. They invent some of the earliest economic activities. Money is ancient. It is an absolutely ancient technology, and none of us really understand it. When you start trying to explain Bitcoin, what you suddenly realize is that most people don't understand money. Even though it is something that you start learning about at a very, very young age. But even adults don't understand it. And if, you, if you want a demonstration of that fact, Sit down and have a conversation with a four-year-old and try to explain money. And you will find out very quickly that the four-year-old has some very good questions that you can't answer. And you can watch parents go through this. It's hilarious. 
Mommy, where does money come from? The banks make it. Well, how do they make it? Well, they print it. Why can't we have more then? Go clean your room. <laughs> uh, you're about four questions from go clean your room in any money conversation because adults don't really understand money. Very few adults really understand how money works, even though it is a cultural artifact that has existed in our species for hundreds of thousands of years. We don't understand how it works. We've gone through several technology iterations with money. We've started from very basic forms of money. Um, and these basic forms really had certain innate characteristics that made them good as money. So what makes good money? Something that is rare. Shells, feathers. You can use shells as money unless you live on a beach. If you live on a beach, you can't use shells as money. Right? Um, you can transport the value easily, so it has to be portable. With few exceptions, most forms of money are highly <coughs> portable. If the amount of money you need to go and buy a cow is heavier than the cow, that's not very good money. Right? Which is why we don't often see, for example, gold being used for large transactions. It's too damn heavy. Other, for, other characteristics of money it has to be difficult to forge. It has to be difficult to create more of it. You should be able to detect at a glance or relatively easily that it is real. It should be fa fungible. If I'm using shells, then this shell and that shell are both the same money. If I give you a dollar, it doesn't matter which dollar I gave you, it's fungible. Every dollar can substitute every other dollar. So these are the technologies, and gradually over time we've created abstractions. Money itself is an abstraction. If it's not an abstraction, then it's not money, it's barter. If I give you bananas for your goat, that's not money. The bananas are not money because you eat them. You don't use them to do further exchanges. And therefore, that's barter. You're exchanging one commodity for another. But if it's abstract, if it doesn't have any practical use in itself, then as an abstraction of money, it represents something else, some shared value. Which leads to the one inescapable conclusion about money. Money is a shared cultural hallucination. It's a shared delusion. We walk around and associate with other people on the basis of germ-ridden pieces of cotton printed with green ink. And if you were to observe that as an alien anthropologist who landed on Earth, you'd think it was very, very weird. That just by exchanging these pieces of cotton, you could create social relationships and transactions and trade, feed yourself, shelter yourself, etc., etc. It doesn't make much sense. But it's based on a shared hallucination. It's based on the assumption that if you give me a dollar today, someone else will accept that dollar in exchange for something of value tomorrow. And I, if I still believe that is the case, then it has value. Value comes from the assumption that I can use it again. And what Bitcoin is, is just the latest iteration of abstraction. So we've done abstraction, and every time we do abstraction of money, society freaks out. Because this new thing can't possibly be real money. Go back and look at what happened with the introduction of coins stamped out of non-precious metal. And then eventually, paper notes. When paper notes were first circulated, no one believed that they had value. The shared hallucination had not taken hold yet. And it was very difficult to persuade people to exchange real gold coins or silver coins for pieces of paper that said that they had gold in a vault. And then take it a step further, disappear the gold from the vault and say, turns out it's just the paper. You ask people about Bitcoin, and one of the first things I hear from most people 
is it's not real money because it's not backed by gold like the U.S. dollar, <laughs> which I find astonishing. The dollar hasn't been backed by gold since 1936. And, and yet most people think that somewhere in a vault, possibly Fort Knox or some other movie location, there are bars of gold that correspond ingot to ingot to the pieces of column paper you have in your pocket. And they don't. There's no such thing. 